SGA puts on an MVP performance and OKC shows why they are true contenders on today's show. You are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Locked On Thunder podcast, on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, media member, and inside the Thunder beat writer, Ryland Styles. Follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunder Pod. Email the show, LO Thunder Pod at gmail.com. On today's show, brought to you by Game Time, we're diving into the Oklahoma City Thunder, flexing their contending muscles as SGA puts on an MVP impact, and you saw some of the adjustments from Chet Holmgren. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. Go download the Game Time app, create your account, and use code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. So in this game, SGA returns to the fold. Uh, J-Dub returns as well. And you're playing a Kings team that is scrapping for their playoff life. You do not want to fall in the play-in tournament. There's so many variables, especially for a Kings team uh, that is down a lot of players, is going to be lacking depth in that tournament. And last year, they were a three seed. So this is quite the fall for the scrappy Kings, who uh, now are looking like a team you'd project to not even survive the play-in tournament because of games like this, where they consistently let go of the rope throughout the contest. And so you have to give the Thunder credit for weathering this storm. Sacramento comes out on fire from three. Keon Ellis puts up a career game in one half of basketball. The Kings grew a 20-point lead. And they never lost that lead throughout the first half. In that first half, Oklahoma City was disoriented. They were lapsing on defense from great ball movement from Sacramento. They were being just dominated on the glass and those long rebounds and and the ability to, whenever you have to play in a crowd in the paint uh, for the, for the Kings to spray it out to the corner shooters and then knock down threes. They were hot, hot, hot from beyond the arc. And then on the thunder side, you know, they miss some open guys, which is rare. Number one, they miss some open, open guys by probing into the lane and then just not kicking it out to open shooters who they had available to them, uh, which is obviously something that is spectacularly rare for this Thunder team to not have good ball movement. Even whenever they had the vision and had the the wherewithal to kick to an open player, whether they're cutting down uh, or, or in the pick and roll, whatever, they had an errant lob pass. That they threw some fastballs for cutters that were just fumbled away uh, and some miscommunication there. So this was, in the first half, not Thunder basketball at all. This was a sloppy affair, and it looked like this opportunity where you have Shea back, you have J-Dub back. At the time, uh, Washington was dominating Minnesota. That score also did not hold. Uh, But you had this opportunity, and it looked like it was all for naught. But Shea mentioned after the game that at halftime, the Thunder went in wanting to force the Kings to call the first timeout of the half, and they did just that. You saw this flip of a switch, both in terms of engagement in terms of activity on both ends and sharpness on both ends. But you also saw the the game planning shift from the first half to the second half that allowed them to go execute better, uh, which I imagine they were trying to do for 48 minutes, but they end up getting it done in the second half. And that's going to be so big in the playoffs. These adjustments that you make at halftime, these adjustments you make game to game, especially with a whole week off before your first playoff game, you have to really like the Thunder's advantage in that category of creating mismatches, creating opportunities like that uh, to to adjust on the fly to, and the Thunder's proven track record. We talked about the Kings track record. It's that of a team that does not persevere, that does not uh, handle adversity well, that does not hold big leads, and and they are on the wrong end of those things. The the Thunder, on the other hand, have put out a, a complete body display of a team that's going to handle your best punch, 
And you might knock them on the ropes in the opening half, but they're going to keep chipping away. They're going to keep coming back. And with basketball being a game of runs and the Thunder having such a talented roster, odds are they're going to get back in the fight. And at that point, it's anybody's game. And you go back to having, uh, you know, one of the best players in this league in SGA. You have you have JW, you have Chet. And so in a star-driven league, if you can make this a game late, that's all you can ask for, no matter what the destination or the journey it took to get there. That's the destination you want. In the playoffs, end of games, you want it close. You want it to be the team that has stars on it in a close game. I don't care what the first three quarters look like. It comes down to how you execute in, at the end in that setting. And so getting to that setting has not been a problem for the Thunder. And this year, whenever they're fully healthy, neither has closing out games in that setting as they closed out this game against Sacramento. You know, and, and the Kings, it felt like we're just, just completely dominating the glass. And they were. But the end up total ends up being Sacramento 63 rebounds uh, to OKC's 56. And the Thunder, in turn, for 17 Kings turnovers. The Thunder had 13 of their own where they cleaned it up in the second half. OKC won points in the paint. Uh, they they won fast break points by one. But Sacramento really hung around and, and you know, of course, first swelled their lead, but then hung around uh, by their ability to, to, to capitalize on second chance points, 21 to 16. And, and the Kings end up shooting for as much as we just talked about how hot they were and you know how great of an outburst it was offensively for them, they end up shooting 34, 34, 73. That, that certainly did not feel like the Kings shot 34% from three. But the Thunder were sharper in their rotations. They understood when to gap better and when to not crowd the paint in the second half better. And just some natural regression from the Kings. And you end up at a game where the Kings shot 34% from the floor and from three. And then both teams missed critical free throws. Kings are no different. So both teams, as the Kings shoot 73% at the line, the Thunder shoot 74% at the line, are going to want some of those uh, pivotal swings back. The Thunder end up shooting 48%, 36%, 74%. Five lead changes, seven ties. The Thunder never grew a lead past seven, and that was at the very end of the game. And the, con the contending Thunder... You know, held on and braced themselves for a King's avalanche and then gave one right back with one of the best home court advantages in the NBA. I talked to Sabonis before the game, and, and we talked about Chet. We talked about the playoff environment. You can read the story in Inside the Thunder. Uh, at some point today, it'll come out. I'll tweet it out, of course, at Riley underscore Styles. We talked pregame uh, about just me and him in the locker room talking about the, the journey that he had his rookie year with the Thunder and what it's like playing in this building in the postseason. And he mentioned how it's a huge factor and it's a huge swing and this was a playoff level crowd. This was a crowd uh, that gave you some advantage and you saw some players giving props to it. Afterward, you saw Shea play the most emotional game of his career. This is a guy who likes to play the role uh, of a stone cold killer, likes to play the role. A typical Gildas Alexander vehicle is one of a cold blooded killer. And yet today he let the emotions fly. Yet today, he went out there and gave the fans huge props post-game and let them in on the excitement that was this game. And it's not as though the Kings rolled over and died. They gave back a middle third quarter run to OKC, which they were able to get back from the Thunder. And what's more, most impressive about all of this, because we're going to dive into Shea putting on an MVP performance, his health, and, and, and again, about that emotion. We'll dive into Chet. We'll dive into it all. But one of the most impressive parts about this and why I believe that this team uh, is at that contending level. Number one, it's a star-driven league, and you have one of the brightest stars in the league. Number two, you've shown throughout the regular season where Mark has not at all shrunk the rotation, which is important to note, when we're talking about how even with Shea off the floor, this team goes on these mega runs to get these comebacks. Once they come back you know, and, and Shea leaves, and that's the time where other teams want to capitalize. Okay, you made your run with your superstar, but now that he's on the bench, this is our time is what you're thinking if you're on the other side. The Thunder can, can just not, not only sustain, 
but consistently throughout the year, they've been able to stack the lead up in that setting. And so you shift into this playoff mindset where Shea's going to play more minutes, Jada will play more minutes, and the, the finite amount of time that you will play without your superstar on the floor, you have to have the utmost confidence that it is going to work out for you because that's what's happened throughout the 82 game sample size. And it happened again in this game. So the Thunder are in a fantastic position. This game embodied sort of who they've been this season. And SGA put out a great case for his MVP campaign. We'll talk about that coming up. But first, I want to say right now about our good friends over at Game Time. Game Time is exactly where you want to be. This is the perfect day to use Game Time because Game Time is now the authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes uh, getting tickets even faster and easier. Uh, prices on the Game Time app are actually uh, going down as it gets closer to first pitch or to tip off of the op- of the game that you want to get to. So with killer last minute deals on all these prices uh, and a view from your seat, make sure you check it out today at game time. But the reason I think that you should go to game time today is because if you live in Oklahoma city, you might be, you might be feeling that kind of uh, vibe of, Oh, what a comeback win. You know, you've caught the case of the thunder. You want to go to the Paycom center tonight and you look at the schedule and see it's the Spurs and you might be thinking to yourself, well, I'm going to get to see Victor and get to see Chet. Well, game time's going to let you wait it out because right now on a sec on the second night of back to back, Victor's status is up in the air, according to the Spurs. So you might want to wait closer to tip-off, which is the advantage of game time uh, that you can do that because you have the last-minute deals, lowest prices guaranteed. Save up to Stay up to 60% off of buying uh, your tickets at the last minute from sports to concerts and movies and theaters. Uh, but it's great to wait to the last minute, especially in the NBA. That way you know exactly who's going to play, exactly what you're walking into in the arena because we've all been there where, where we are anticipating a game all day long you sit down for tip off, whether you're at the arena or you're watching on TV, and then you realize, oh wait, this is a completely different game. This star is not playing, and this game has has relatively no meaning anymore. So you can go to Game Time and wait that out for you uh, at Game Time. Go there right now. Use code Locked On NBA. That's L O C K E D O N N B A for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Locked On NBA code at Game Time. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen. Subscribe for free across all podcasting platforms so you never miss an episode. Let's talk SGA. What an MVP level performance that this was. 40 points, 7 rebounds, 4 assists, 2 steals, 2 blocks, 2 for 3 from 3, 52% from the floor. And I think that in this game, You saw that he had five turnovers, and he was pressing a little bit in the first few minutes back in that fourth quarter. But he settles in and takes over the final two minutes of this game. Absolutely takes it over. He goes 16 for 20 at the free throw line. Starts this game out with that patented baseline fadeaway jumper. Shows off this unbelievable Euro step to create space and finish at the rim has one of his most impressive buckets of the season where he gives you 50 pump fakes and a step through to get a mid-range jumper in. And he said after the game that, believe it or not, he does practice that because he practices mainly in the offseason how to create space after you've picked up your dribble. That's exactly what he did on that play. The step back three that sent Davion Mitchell flying to the next universe the block of Keon Ellis for three at the end of the third quarter where he gives this massive fist pump to the crowd. And then owning that last two minutes, willing this Thunder team to a win and keeping his team in check, keeping his team uh, under control whenever you get down 20, you take on the identity of two people on your basketball team. Number one, your head coach. Number two, your superstar. And oftentimes, your superstars are ahead of your head coach most of, most of the time in the NBA. Not saying that's the case in Oklahoma City, but a lot of the times around the league, you look at your superstar and see if he's happy first. But those two guys really are the obvious leaders of these franchises. And if your superstar doesn't care about defense, then you think that you cannot care about defense. If your superstar gets away with something, then you think that you can get away with it. You see it time and time again, these teams that take on the identity of the coach and the superstar. And Shea's identity 
is clearly showing itself onto these other players, both with how they play between the whistles and also how they carry themselves in moments of adversity. And so the MVP of this league is someone like Shea who makes these adjustments mid-game, who dominates on both ends, who scores efficiently, and keeps his team composed and together to win a game like this. And we mentioned it in the first segment, but the amount of emotion that he showed in this game was more than he's shown in his entire career. The fist bump toward the crowd after the Ellis block. At the buzzer, winning this game in the fourth quarter, at the buzzer, begging fans for more noise, cupping his ear, begging fans to get louder, high-fiving fans before going over to the to the bench and going over to the Nick, Nick Gallo interview, engaging with them after that game is something we rarely see from Shea. And he said after the game that he did it because he missed the fans he hadn't played in front of the fans in a long time because of how the schedule worked out and his injury. And he mentioned how you know vital that the fans are and everything, but like that he missed that feeling. And if this you know is something that it's it's got Shea's attention clearly, J Dub tweets about it after the game, and it was a really a really good crowd. But if this is something that they are rallying around and that they are using as ammunition throughout games and heading into games. Just imagine what it'll be like when they walk into the Paycom Center for game one next week. That's something that, th despite this year there being pops, there being moments, there being segments where you can feel what it used to feel like, that's something that you still have not touched in the Paycom Center yet and won't touch until next week for game one of the playoffs. And the overcoming of emotion especially for a guy like Shea, for a guy like Lou, for a guy like Kendrick Williams, for a guy like Mark, who've been here through the course of the losing, through the course of the rebuild, and has and have came out on the other side and are now in this position. And you go down the list. Lou Dort's an undrafted rookie that makes an impact in the bubble playoffs, but was undrafted when he gets his start in Oklahoma City. Kendrick Williams was a throw into the Stephen Adams trade. Nobody knew what he would be. Nobody knew if he'd make the team. You remember the TJ Leaf roster bubble talks? It rivaled Jack White roster bubble talks this year. Nobody knew if Kenny was going to stay around for more than a season. He's now one of the most vital uh, veterans in that locker room and a key cog of the rotation, especially against certain matchups. You've seen Shea evolve into a fun story on that bubble team and then get the keys of this franchise bestowed upon him and take his game from fringe all-star to all-star to MVP. You've seen Mark as a guy who, uh, you know, whenever he was hired, nobody knew who he was. People still don't know who he is uh, in a lot of the pockets of the NBA. People were wondering, is he just going to be a guy who's just a lame duck sitting there until this team gets good where they can go find their next guy? Instead, he's the best coach in franchise history. He's one of the best coaches in the NBA, and he's going to experience coaching the playoffs in front of this crowd for the first time next week. The emotion that's going to come with that game one, I think, is going to be overwhelming. I think... If you want to, if you're a betting person, you should go to our good friends over at FanDuel, and I don't care what the line is or who the opponent is, Take the Thunder in that game. Take the Thunder in game one. But speaking of SGA, his health is the biggest talking point. He returned uh, against New York last week, and he was not himself. He did hit the game winner, credit to him, but he did not play well at all. And besides that game, he missed six of the last seven games, right? That was the only game he played in. And this is all stemming from a March 20th uh, quad injury against Utah. He mentioned today that he feels 100%. And from March 20th until now, he's never felt 100% until now. And you look on the court, this version of Shea tonight can get you anywhere you want to go. This version of Shea tonight can get you past any matchup put in front of you. It's not going to be easy. You're not going to sweep anyone. Heck, you're probably not going to gentleman sweep anyone. But they can get past anyone in the NBA playoffs with this version of Shea. And that's what it was for. That's what last week was for. When you're not playing him and you're going on your first three-game losing streak of the season, it was for the ability to have him back to this point. 
of being and feeling 100%. Now, look, his back-to-back you know, segment is certainly up in the air still. We'll see what the injury report says. We'll see what Mark says pregame. Obviously, that's separate. You can't help that he comes back on the front end of the back-to-back. He might play. He might not play. Who knows? But in general, you put this performance up, you put the fact you have a week off next week up, and you see they did it. They've accomplished their goal. They stole a game in Charlotte and, and got the win. He came in and won you a game in New York to book in the road trip. And sure, you might have sacrificed those three games in the middle. But you were able to get him back to this MVP level. And that's what that whole thing was for. Let's talk J-Dub as well. I think that J-Dub is not going to get the credit that he deserves for this game because it was not a loud box score, 11 points, six boards, four steals. I mean, sorry, four assists and a steal. But I think that he helped tremendously in the activity defensively, both via rebounds, be it via closing out to shooters, plugging the gap and rotating uh, crisply and running the floor hard in transition. So credit to J-Dub for making an impact on this one, especially down the stretch, especially in that second half. And I thought that Lou Dort course corrected very well in this game. You know, uh, he he started the game and you you cannot deny that, that he was bad at the rim to start this game. It did not look good. But to his credit, he reeled things back in in the second half and he finishes with 18 points, two boards, two assists, two steals, three for six from three, 54% from the floor overall. So yeah, he had the bad drives, but but he was able to even things out. Coming up, let's talk Wiggins, let's talk Jay, let's talk Chet, let's talk Isaiah Joe as well. But first one's here right now, about good friends over at BetterHelp. Check out BetterHelp because they're great and they're here for you. BetterHelp. You know, it understands that sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest, both big or small. Certain things can really start to get to you. It's important to let that out, especially to someone who's unbiased in your life. So today, make sure you check out BetterHelp because they can provide that for you. If you're someone who feels like you can you know, benefit from the from the advantages of therapy, BetterHelp's a place for you because, uh, at least for me, a lot of the times, you know, you look at therapy and say, well, it'd be great, but I'm too busy. I, I can't find time to go to a, to a brick and mortar place and go uh, to talk to this therapist. Here's the kicker though, with better help, it's entirely online and it's entirely there for you around your schedule with a licensed therapist. So take, uh, you know, the, the, the opportunity to go to better help at betterhelp.com, H-E-L-P.com slash Locked on NBA. That's betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA for 10% off your first month. I love BetterHelp as an option, especially because they're going to not only tailor things around your schedule, um, but you thought this questionnaire, they're going to match with a licensed therapist. And if you don't like that therapist, you can re roll until you find the perfect match for you. So you're going to get the perfect match of a therapist for free after you, you know, you can re roll for free uh, to get that therapist match and then start your. Uh, your therapy process. Uh, so start therapy over at betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA. That's betterhelp.com, H E L P.com slash locked on NBA. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. I want to talk Chet Holmgren. I think the Chet Holmgren was really good in this game, defensively, especially. Uh, 15 points, nine boards, two assists, two steals, two blocks, two for five from three. A lot of twos. A deuce is wild on the stat sheet for Chet Holmgren. 55% from the floor, just erasing possessions as a defender. And he made the adjustments of Sabonis. Sabonis comes in this game, it only has eight points on seven shots, 13 rebounds, five assists, and a steal, and two offensive fouls. Chet hits this amazing spinning fadeaway over Sabonis. Got a lob from J-Dub. And Sabonis offered high praise for how great Chet is uh, before this game. And he's talked about how you know he continuously is figuring things out at the NBA level. Again, you can check out that story inside the Thunder um, today. Isaiah Joe, what a weapon that he is for the Thunder offense. I mean, the movement three that he hit, running the floor in transition uh, from a no-look pass by Chet, uh, coming off the J-Will screen for a mid-range jumper, uh, gets a steal for K- as Queso's fronting Sabonis. The pass uh, is errant, and it leads kind of uh, in the wrong direction. Joe flies in and, and intercepts it like a safety uh, and runs the floor the other way, and the Thunder get a transition bucket that way. 
Uh, it was a J-Dub finish uh, on that instance. 10 points, four rebounds, an assist, and two steals. Speaking of Jalen Williams layups, Jay Will also had a fantastic jelly finish in this one uh, that is unbelievable hang time. He's continuously done this his career to just show this unreal hang time and touch around the rim in these instances. He did it again today to the tune of four points, one board, two assists in 16 minutes. But it, the biggest thing about Jay Willis is playmaking and his improved screening. Number one, the brick wall screen on Harrison Barnes for an easy bucket was huge. Nearly had Barnes on the ground. Number two, we mentioned the Joe mid-range jumper. He freed up Joe with a screen on Ellis to get Ellis off of Isaiah Joe. But I, I saw this fantastic play, and I, and I want to clip it you know, tonight or, or something. But uh, you know, obviously the Kings came out aggressively blitzing the ball handler in the pick and roll, blitzing Shea, blitzing Dub. And so j and j were on this high pick and roll. And out of that high pick and roll, j flings it over the defense to j on the short roll. j around the free throw on the extended area, kicks it to the corner to Lou Dort. Lou Dort uh, got a off-ball pin-down screen from Wiggins. Wiggins pops to the slot off of that pin-down screen. Dort gets it in the corner and then fires it ahead to the slot for Wiggins for three. Wide open three, fantastic ball movement, fantastic you know play design by Mark, and it gets Wiggins a wide open three. The shot did not go in. But you love the look. You love the look. Like you, that, you cannot draw anything up any better than that. And more often than not, with the, one of the best three-point shooting teams in the NBA, that's a look that'll go in. And Wiggins, to his, to his credit, had a great night with a massive and one. Uh, he, he had a put back whenever this team was bleeding offensively. Seven points, four rebounds, an assist, a block, three for four shooting, 18 minutes Again, keep playing him, but play him even more. I mean, it's got to be 20-plus, I feel like, for Wiggins. 25 points is not insane for what he provides as an energy spark, as a defender, as a play finisher, uh, and, and, and the scoring in the variety of ways that he does. But I think that this game showed the Thunder are contenders. I think this game showed Shea's MVP. And now you have a chance to continue to live up to these philosophies that you've kind of preached upon for the last few years and stack days, stack another good day tomorrow against the bad, uh, you know, Spurs team. I know it's the back-to-back. -back. They're coming off a of back-to-back too. They're having to travel from that back-to-back. -back. So stack another good day, get a big win because tomorrow you see the Nuggets and Timberwolves face off. Somebody's got to lose that game. And in a three-way tie, guess who, guess who's the one seed. So you've got to keep pace. You've got to get, get going and it's going to be interesting to see who plays, who doesn't play, because both teams are on a back-to-back. -back. Spurs traveling to OKC from, uh, from Memphis. It is not on national TV. It's on the road against Chet. And Victor cannot output, uh, outproduce, I don't think, what he did against Chet last time out. So with Pop saying that his status is uncertain, it wouldn't stun me if he didn't play. Obviously, these guys are two competitors who, regardless of what they say publicly, are really taking this matchup uh, to another level and and are building the next great NBA rivalry together. So uh, I, I think that he could play. Obviously, it's uncertain right now if he will play uh, for, for the Spurs side of things. But regardless, the Thunder need to get this win. Thunder have guys, of course, who who... Uh, status, I'm sure, is unclear at the moment from the fact that you just had J-Dub and Shea uh, return to the team this game. MVP of the game will be SGA. We'll see how the injury reports shake out for that game against the Spurs um, tomorrow. You can keep up to date uh, by following me at Ryland underscore Styles and going to Inside the Thunder and subscribing to Lockdown Thunder anywhere you get your podcast from. On YouTube, you can subscribe. Uh, any other podcasting catcher that you have, you can subscribe to Lockdown Thunder. Uh, we're going to be here for you every single day. We're starting the playoff push. So after tomorrow's game, it'll be another recap show where we will recap it on Thursday, the, the Spurs game. Friday's show will be very fun. We do our stock watch uh, series. It's the last one of the regular season. It's the last one heading into the playoffs. Whose stock is rising? Whose stock is falling? And off of that comes uh, what should the playoff rotation look like for the Thunder? Saturday, of course, is a Bucks recap. Sunday, the Mavericks recap because Monday starts the playoff preview extravaganza that you will not want to miss. So we're going to have our just normal show Monday, but then guest on guest on guest rolling through to preview the first real playoff series 
of this podcast history with me at the helm. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I want to obviously uh, going to thank all of our guests who are going to come on. It's going to be a lot of fun guys that you love uh, and, and, and follow along with, of course, including uh, me as well on the show. I appreciate that. Again, if you're going to be at the games uh, section 104, you can come down, get a Lockdown Thunder sticker. I had a couple of guys do that as well. So shout out um, to you guys getting the Lockdown Thunder stickers. Uh, of course, Dawson Hicks, uh, who came down. I hope it's okay to say anyone on the podcast. I should have probably asked you that first. Nonetheless, thank you all for listening to Lockdown Thunder. Uh, subscribe anywhere you should podcast from. And until tomorrow, be good and be good to one 